My main research topic is basically to understand the mechanism underlying skin damage by sunlight. And while I'm telling you, probably you're just asking yourself, why on earth I'm doing research about skin cancer and sunlight in a country like UK, where there is almost no sun? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is true. But yet, the fact that we are lacking sun in this country and we don't have a lot of sunny days uh, around us during the year, what happens is that when this happens at bus, what we do, we just rush to the sun. We all go out and we cannot get enough of it. And uh, at some point also, we start abusing of the situation, even lie in the city center under the sunlight for a long time. So what happens is that our skin gets exposed to for long hours to sunlight, and uh, this is not enough only. We also want, are eager to go to holidays, to sunny places, and expose more our skin to the sun because we just don't have enough sun in our country here. So this would have been okay if we, we had a skin like these lovely animals here that could protect themselves. But the reality is that we, we don't have such a protected skin, and as such, we are just exposing our skin to this burning sun, which I have called it the sun beast. So that is why also the sad consequence of just exposing a very unprepared and unprotected skin to sunlight is that the skin starts developing skin cancer. And skin cancer, unfortunately, is most common malignancy among Caucasian populations, like people living in the UK. And its incidence also is globally increasing year by year. So to understand this, we have to look at the type of skins that Caucasian populations they have. The human skin is basically divided in six types. And this classification is based on skin color and its tanning ability, and also its susceptibility to sunburn, which has also a direct relationship to susceptibility to develop skin cancer. And within this country and Caucasian population, the skin color is very white. And as you can see, it has a very poor tanning ability. And as such, it has a high susceptibility to sunburn and also a high susceptibility to skin cancer. This would mean that a skin type 1 and two, type 2 person, when it goes to the sun, they will never tan, but they will burn. And that, was, that is what will happen is that by frequent sunburn and exposure to sunlight, you get this cumulative damage, which eventually ends up to initiate and promote the carcinogenesis. But this is not a serious story for the people who have a skin type 3, 4, 5, 6, because as you could see in this table, they have a very good tanning ability, and as a result, they have also very low susceptibility to sunburn, and also, therefore, susceptibility to develop skin cancer. So therefore, a dark skin is naturally more resistant to sunburn, and as such, it can cope better with the sunlight exposure than a lighter skin. So we could ask ourselves the question, what is the exact cause of the skin damage in Caucasian population? And for this, I would suggest that we look at the uh, radiations which are emitted from the sun. Sun emits a wide range of radiation. And here I have only depicted for you the three radiations which are ultraviolet, visible, and infrared. The visible uh, radiation is basically detected by the eye and is used for the sight. The infrared radiation is basically detected by sensory system within the skin as you can feel the heat of the sun, but unfortunately, the skin has no sensory system for ultraviolet radiation. And as such, if you expose your body intentionally or unintentionally to ultraviolet radiation, you will never know how much dose of ultraviolet radiation has gone through your skin. 
And that is what is the danger of the sunlight for us. The ultraviolet radiation is divided into three uh, uh, subgroups. These are UVC, UVB, and UVA. UVC and the majority of UVB are basically cut off by the ozone layer in the stratosphere. So the only UV, UV radiation that basically reach the surface of Earth are UVB and UVA, and looking at the proportion of this uh, two UV radiation that reach the surface of Earth, you can see that basically sun is primarily a source of UVA. Now UVA, unfortunately itself, is known to be a powerful carcinogen. And why UVA is a powerful carcinogen? This is because uh, studies from our laboratory and others have strongly demonstrated that UVA causes strong dam damage to skin cell constituents, such as the fat in a protein, and as such, UVA is considered as a serious risk factor, not only in the skin cancer development, but also for something that ladies are very scared, photoaging. So uh, why UVA is particularly damaging, it's also the fact that if you look at the skin section, you will see that actually UVA penetrates much, much deeper in the skin than UVB, which is a shorter wavelength. And as such, even a good proportion of it can reach the subcutaneous tissue in a way that you will have where the blood vessel lies. So UVA even reach your blood vessels underneath the skin. UVA is also particularly damaging when we talk about solarium centers. Solarium centers uh, are actually, uh, sorry, solarium centers are actually have become recently very attractive for young populations. This is because uh, young populations, teenagers, they have this rush to be fashionable and becoming, uh, having this very slim and healthier look very, very fast. And what do they do? In millions of them, they go every day to sun tanning saloons to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they have this very bad perception and culture within their, uh, the young population which are developing is that tanned skin is a beautiful skin, so I want to become beautiful. So more tanned I am, more beautiful I am. Uh, and as such, what they do, they expose their un unprotected and unprepared skin for uh, hours and hours uh, under the sunning lamps without knowing that the 95% of the output of a sun tanning lamp is actually UVA. So they are exposing themselves to UVA, basically. And sun tanning lamps are now recognized as one of the most dangerous cancer-causing agents. And because of that, uh, the authorities in UK and also other countries have recently limited the age of going to solariums to 18. But this is, is still not enough because what is happening is that, uh, as you can see, it's still using a sun tanning bed before the age of 35 increased highly the risk of developing a skin cancer by 90%. <coughs> so I would like to tell to these populations who go to sun, sun tanning beds that tanned skin is not a beautiful skin, it's actually damaged skin. And there is no such things as a safe tan. So pe when people ask me, oh, how can I get tanned and not damaged? I said, well, what you can do is you can go and use this artificial sun tanning creams as long as you don't mind the smell and you don't want to glow like a carrot in the dark. <laughs> so that is as much of an answer that I can come with them. So, um, and my advice for such people is that if I would approach a sun tanning lamp, I would approach it the same way I approach my UVA lamp in the laboratory with a <laughs> full face mask and a covered body. So I will definitely will not lie half naked under that lamp for sure. <laughs> so 
uh, and this is also something that my, my dear friend here has found me as, as a photo. And here I think this is a point there, that they might to look tanning as casual as buying an ice cream. And this is what is dangerous, really. Coming back to the outdoor, uh, the proportion of UVB and UVA during the day are very different. And I would like to pass on here a message that UVB is highest in the sky uh, uh, during the noon, for example. But the proportion of UVA and the maximum amount of UVA radiation in the sunlight is either in the early morning and late afternoon. And these things will coincide, for example, in a sunny day morning, you go having your coffee and breakfast on a sunny terrace and taking the sun, thinking that the sun at this moment is not very strong. And what happens is that at that moment, UVA is the maximum. Or in the late afternoon, you are in the beach in a holiday, and suddenly you feel that, oh, it seems like that sun is not strong enough. Oh, let's go to a terrace and have a cocktail. So you all go and sit in a terrace and continue to get irradiation of sun and having your cocktail. And at the same time, you don't know that at that time, you need a good sun protection because UVA is maximum. So these are the things that I think we should think about it. So my advice is that at all time, you have to get proper protection against both UVA and UVB component of sunlight. And for this, obviously, you would need sun lotion or sun cream to protect yourself. And even paintings need some protection. As you can see here, uh, inspiration of, you know, some protection by some of painters. Now what I would like to share with you is my perception of this gender difference to sunlight protection. There is a kind of a trend all over the world. A lady is much more willing to go and put cream and protect themselves than gentlemen, because somehow they feel that they are invincible against sunlight. And as such, they will go even through all sorts of unconventional and un un efficient way of protecting themselves from the sunlight, just not to put sun cream. And this is the photo of my dear partner sitting here in the audience. <laughs> and what will happen with that is the consequence of it that next day, if you don't have a proper protection, you will get a horrible sunburn. You will have a very bad night not sleeping. The next day you will look itchy, and if you have exaggerated too much, you will have an, in a few days you will have a peeled skin. And at this moment, it's only the gentleman thinks, well, maybe next time when I go, I might put a bit of sun cream on my body. <laughs> so that is what. So my advice to all the gentlemen is that perhaps we need a change of attitude with gentlemen too. Maybe you should also protect you, yourself by putting some sun sprays and some sun creams and even, you know, put some protective clothes uh, for yourself. Why not? <laughs> Another thing is that is a fact, and I would like to emphasize because I think it's important to know and, and we just underestimate is that, that a child needs much more effective protection than an adult because there is now a causal relationship ha that has been identified between the level of prolonged unprotected uh, exposure of a child to the sunlight and the development of skin cancer in early young adulthood. So this is something that I would like to pass on as a message. And the other thing is also that as age difference is also important in sun protection in terms of elderly, elderly, they will more susceptible to sunlight uh, than the, uh, the much younger populations. Now, if you ask me, when I go to buy a sun cream um, in, in a store, how, how would I buy a sun cream that would protect myself? I will have these three criteria that I will pay attention. I will make sure that my sun cream will have a broad spectrum protection against both UV and UVB. I will make sure that the sun protection factor of the sun lotion is at least between 30 and 50 to mop up 98% of UV. 
And also I will make sure that it has a proper high UV index label. Now, if you look at the available sun creams, although these are written on a sun cream lotions, what is important to know that in terms of biology uh, study, these uh, sun creams, they give more protection for UVB component of sunlight than against UVA component of sunlight. And most of the time to get broad protection, they need to add one active sunscreen ingredients in addition to the UV filters to get the protection they, they claim. Also, this kind of sun creams, they have to be applied 30 minutes before you enter the sun and then get reapplied 30 minutes after entering the sun. And also, most importantly, you have to not forget to reapply if you go for swimming or you have towel yourself. And if you don't follow these rules, although you put a sun cream on your skin, you're not really protected. <laughs> so the desirable sunscreen lotion ac actually should have a proper protection against UV and UVA, UVB, but we, we taught also in our laboratory that the protection should be also available on demand because some areas of the body has to be protected more than the other areas because they, they actually are exposed more. So in collaboration uh, with Dr. Ian Eggleston, a medicine chemist and senior lecturer in our department, we designed uh, what uh, they are called as UVA-activated ingredients for some protection. These compounds are, are interesting because they would provide the optimal on-demand protection against UVA. So what does it mean is that you can apply this cream at your own time, whenever, even the day before if you want. You go through the sunlight, and these ingredients will stay inactive in your skin unless you are exposed to a harmful dose of sunlight. And only with the, uh, at this very real time that these ingredients will be activated and therefore in the real time and in the right time and in the right place will, uh, will take care of the damage and protect you. And this kind of ingredients can be either applied as a daily skincare, every day, you know, moisturizers that you put, you can put it there. Or if you want, you can also add it uh, as an ingredient in sunscreens. So the idea of this UV activated protection will be that you will look like these ladies, you know, you will have a protection at all time. And, uh, uh, and wherever that you will get a dose of sunlight that which, ca which can be damaging for you, then what will happen is that when and where these uh, uh, ingredients will be activated in your skin and protect you. These are uh, all the teams of my group and Dr. Eggleston who have contributed to design and study of uh, such an ingredients. On the top you will see uh, Dr. Eggleston, and uh, uh, Dr. Roger Dundi, Mr. Kunal Tiwari, which is a PhD student uh, uh, with me and Dr. Eggleston, and Dr. Benjamin Young, who has done a lot of uh, synthesis of these compounds. And here in my group, we have Dr. Olivia Reeves, who is a senior uh, research fellow who has done most of the uh, in vivo studies of this um, uh, ingredients, and as well as Dr. Tina Ratka, my postdoc, and my postgraduate student, Shara Hushmandir, another Shara, but this time with S, and also uh, Dr. Asma Aron, who has left recently my laboratory. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>